Ready. Are we ready? We're good? Good morning, class. I said good morning. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, so we begin today the end, the beginning of the end. Uh oh, I'm, I hear the, uh, the feedback in the back there. Testing. Yep. Anyhow, uh, we begin today the last of our sessions on the Holy Family. I think I'll probably wait till you push the mute button. Maybe Alex can help. Alex can. <laughs> For those of you that are listening, you got to see, you got to go with the, the Gen Z people. They know how, to, they know how things work. <laughs> All right, so we begin today the, the last of our sessions on the Holy Family. Uh, it was to be a nine-session nine course. It became an eight-session course when we had a snow day in January, a long time ago. We were intercepted uh, during the season of pre-Lent and Lent with a course on asceticism uh, by now Father Kimbrell. And we're back to the Holy Family for the thrilling conclusion. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who has committed to Thy Holy Church the care and nurture of Thy people, enlighten with Thy wisdom those who teach and those who learn, that rejoicing in the knowledge of Thy truth, they may worship Thee and serve Thee from generation to generation, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All right, we are going to review real quickly where we've been. Uh, we are then going to ask some questions about implications for this study about the Holy Family, and really uh, further uh, implications of the last study that we did, or the last session, about the household codes, if you remember, which is really, in the end, about the application of, of basically a New Testament picture of the family. And what I'll get to here eventually is the idea that in the Old Testament, in a sense, we learn about the family via negativa, in other words, by seeing the opposite of what the family ought to be in many ways. And then in the New Testament, we see in the holy family and in the household codes a via positiva, which is the opposite, which is you learn by uh, the model or the ideal. And so either way, there's something to learn. Old Testament, New Testament, uh, from the Garden of Eden to the book of Revelation, there's something to learn about the Holy Family. And so we'll, we'll, we'll begin with this review. When we introduced the study of holy, uh, the Holy Family, we asked, of course, as all introductions do, why study the Holy Family? And the answer, I would say, one of the answers we gave was because the family is meant to orient one in the world. And in the Christian faith, the family is of deep theological import. Something I've said again and again in this course is that the family is to orient you in the world, and even a broken family can orient you. Because when you are abandoned by a father or a mother, the pain is, or it, you could say it's disorienting emotionally, but it's still orienting you towards a father or mother that would stay. It, the orientation is still there. The, the sorrow that comes from a broken family, the reason that sorrow isn't joy is that the, the holy family is meant to be. And so the sorrow that comes is actually still preaching the holy family to you through your own uh, experience. Um, that theological message is inescapable because each one of us, whether we want to or not, was born of a father and a mother. That's it. There isn't another way. 
even if you talk about, you know, artificial insemination or petri, there's still a father and a mother, there just is, um, that you could point to. Um, that is woven into the nature of what it means to be a human being. The big question is, is that just a haphazard, uh, meaningless thing, or is there a message there from God that's woven into us, you can't get away from it, you might as well read the love letter from God and try to take uh, from that message uh, the truth you're meant to receive from the, the holy family, ultimately, talking, you know, St. Mary, St. Joseph, and Jesus, but really the holy family, the family as being holy. Um, another reason to study the holy family is because the family is under attack in our culture, and I could explain how, but you could probably figure it out. Um, when we're talking about uh, headlines and, and social issues, it's easy to see, but when we talk about the philosophy driving the attack, that's a little bit less easy to see, and I'm pointing out to you, uh, I have, as I have several times, the distinction between what we call nominalism and realism. Realism is that things in themselves have intrinsic meaning, including family, father, mother, child. These things have meaning intrinsic to them that can't be separated just by calling it by a different name. The other philosophy is nominalism, which is to say things don't have a meaning in themselves until you assign a name to them or assign a meaning to them. Those are two different philosophies that are slugging it out over the last 800 years, and nominalism in our day is winning big time because all you have to do is come in and call something something else, and we, the rest of us, trip all over ourselves to try and discover what the language is now because we call this something else. So remember, uh, I'm not into the Johnny Depp Amber Heard thing, <laughs> and I, have, I am always astounded that people are paying so much attention, but I did hear something the other day how uh, she had said that she uh, had donated money to a charity, but in fact she had pledged it. And the, the lawyer kept hitting her, did you pledge it or did you donate it? And she said, I use the words synonymously, pledge and donate. In other words, she hadn't donated it, but she had pledged it. So she said she had donated it, but she hadn't. And the lawyer had to point out, None of the rest of us use those two words synonymously. She said, oh, that's interesting, because I do. That's nominalism, okay? That is the flowering of the philosophy of nominalism, which is to say, I didn't give the money, but I donated it. And the rest of the world says, what? And we have to decide whether now we mean by pledge, donate. And uh, you, you can multiply that philosophy by everything going on in the world today, and woof. You know, we're in a mess, right? Or, or we're, we're struggling. <laughs> That's where we're at. That's how the family is under attack. That's the philosophy behind it. There is also sin behind it, but sin is using nominalism. Uh, law of unintended consequences. Nominalism was originally uh, put forward by a Christian who is trying to preserve the sovereignty of God theologically. Whoops. <laughs> Anyhow, that's another story, but I've explained it already. So set, that was session one, the introduction. Session two, uh, we're talking the via negativa, how to learn the negative way. In other words, by seeing the fall of something, the thing itself is revealed. First you look at Eden, and we see that the amagio Dei is family. In other words, the image of God you remember, uh, you know, we are created in the image and likeness of God, and when Adam is created in the image and likeness of God, God said it is good, but it is not good that he should be alone. Interesting. Until there is community, the, the, uh, the image is not fulfilled. The image is not uh, perfect, in a sense. And when... Eve is created, and you have Adam and Eve, then the Lord says, this is good. Now it's good. Because it's not good that he should be alone. That's an interesting thing. Now the fall, we talked about, the nature of the fall was not uh, the uh, creativity of Adam and Eve, their uh, you know, rugged individualism, and their uh, initiative to, you know, 
establish themselves in this world. The nature of the fall was disobedience and faithlessness. They were told what to do, what not to do. They wouldn't do it, and they didn't believe that the Lord, what he said to them, was true. Faithlessness and disobedience are at the heart of, of the nature of the fall. And it's interesting that one of the first things that happens is the family's broken. Um, they're disobedient, they're faithless, they have two kids, they say, surely uh, this won't be passed on to the kids. And <laughs> the one kid takes a rock and smashes the other kid in the head and says, uh, am I my brother's keeper? Okay, so faithlessness and disobedience are passed on. It's the nature of the fall and something uh, we deal with to this day. We talked then about, in other words, you got the idea of via negativa. Obviously, we're not learning from Seth and Cain and Adam and Eve. We're seeing that once that family is broken, you must learn by the opposite way, the via negativa, the fact that there's sorrow suggest that somewhere there's joy. So, um, anyhow, the patriarchs, uh, by, by this we mean Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We see, first of all, sort of in a positive way, that God works through these fathers. Um, and that's great, except that the fathers are not ideal. We, we keep harping on the fact that Abraham... Uh, lied about his wife, said that she was his sister so that she would be taken into a harem and he wouldn't be killed. Ooh, <laughs> that's uh, not the greatest uh, image of the father. And, but through that father, your, your logical thought is, where is the father that would never do that? Where is that father? Where is the father that's faithful and protects um, we even look to the patriarchs and we see something is good and right. God is working through fathers. But uh, this particular father leaves something to be desired. Good statement. What is it that's being desired when there's something to be desired? What is it being desired? Same with Adam and Eve. Uh, you're asking, what is it that I'm desiring? I need a new Eden. Uh, and by the fact that Adam has fallen, we need a new Adam, a second Adam. Uh, by the fact that these patriarchs are okay um, and that God works through them, you still wish that there was a patriarch. I mean, one that was just so good, such a good father. Um, and in a sense, his silhouette is being traced by these uh, fathers who are okay not great. The via negativa continues with the kings, and we're talking here primarily of Saul, David, and Solomon. Uh, you could go on and on with the kings, but we're just talking about the three of the undivided kingdom. So that is uh, Saul, David, and Solomon. We learn from this in a positive way that God works through kings, but when we look at these particular kings, these kings, again, are not ideal, not a one of them. And even David, who's supposed to be the, the greatest of the kings, I mean, you don't have to look far in the scriptures to find where David was uh, flawed. And Saul didn't take very long at all. And Solomon, uh, you, know, there's, you know, there's lots of wisdom in this man. This is an icon of uh, Solomon. But uh, there's wisdom, but good grief. There's a lot of problems there, too. We learn through this via negativa, in other words, that God works through kings, but wouldn't it be great if there was a great king, like the king of kings, the best king, a king that would never have a thousand wives, or 700 wives and 300 concubines, that's Solomon. There would never be a king, or, or this particular king would never t steal someone else's wife and have that man killed in battle and then take his wife as his own. That's not, a you know, that's not the king we're talking about. Where is the king of kings? You see his silhouette is being traced again via negativa. Uh, we look at the Song of Songs then after that, uh, attributed to Solomon typically. 
and we learn that this is not just legal and laws and, and, and such, there's a, actually a romance here. And we look at this book of Song of Songs that was uh, kept from the youth of the Hebrew people for a long time until you're, uh, until you're uh, a teenager or something like that. You weren't allowed to read Song of Songs because you would so easily misunderstand it and you would think this was, you know, uh, you know, some pornographic book in the Bible, and you wouldn't get it. So, since you won't get it, we're not going to let you read it until you, you're old enough to sort of get this. Now, the church has always looked at the Song of Songs as an Old Testament prophecy of the romance between the ultimate bridegroom and the ultimate bride. This is Christ and his church. And it's not just the kind of love that says, you know, he gave himself for me, uh, his blood washes away all my sins, and now I'm saved. It's not just that. It's an infatuation and a longing and a looking forward to being with each other and uh, laying down by cool waters and you know, looking into each other's eyes, even that, even that stuff. Where do you think that comes from? You think God was surprised when, when Adam and Eve fell in love or, or when, when two people fall in love? He, he's the one that made that. <laughs> he created that. Um, but what is he trying to say? We can't look to Solomon and say, well, Solomon is the ideal, and if we could all be more like Solomon, 700 wives, uh, 300 concubines, every woman in the room says, uh-uh, <laughs> not in my house. So, um, you know, here, here's Solomon. We're looking at Solomon. So it can't be Solomon. It can't be David. It can't even really be uh, 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 it can't really be Jacob. It can't really be Abraham. It can't, where is the, this perfect lover, this lover of the loved, and this ideal, his outline is being traced. That was the via negativa. And now uh, in sessions five through seven, we move a little bit more towards via positiva, by the Holy Family. So, now when we see St. Joseph, St. Mary, and Jesus, we look for the big flaw, the big problem, the one that says, oh yeah, but we would never want one like him. Can't find it. Because this is actually the ideal. There's a model here, and there is a, a husband and a wife who the husband could have easily put the wife away quietly, you know, sweep her under the rug, but doesn't. Here's a wife who is obedient to the, the call of the Lord and faithful to her husband. And at the center of their relationship is Christ, with whom every conversation is like a prayer. Holy cow! Now there's an ideal. A husband and a wife who's have Christ at the center of their relationship, who, when Christ is gone, search for him day and night through Jerusalem until finally they find Christ and can put him back at the center of their relationship. It's too good. It's just perfect, right? It's the holy family. Get it? <laughs> All right. Uh, God does work through the mother, the father, and the child. There's something there that goes all the way back to the beginning. There's a new Adam. There's a new Eve. And there's the fruit between them, which is Christ, which is a positive picture. Here is an icon of God's message to us that is woven into our own existence. Even in a fallen world where families fall, if you have to learn about the Holy Family, by the fact that your family is so broken, you're still learning about it. The reason you're not happy that your family is broken is that, there that you have in your mind a, a holy family. And it's sad because you're not a part of a holy family, but in fact you are. Don't get too brokenhearted. You can sorrow, but not as those without hope. So here we are, the holy family via positiva. And then uh, last week we talked about the household codes. Um, and we read uh, Aristotle's household code, which was rough, <laughs> okay? So the best Aristotle could, con could come up with is that the man is the head of the household because the woman is inferior, 
And that's what Aristotle says. Not only that, in your household you'll have slaves, and slaves will be happy to be slaves because they're the kind of people that get owned, and they're happier when they're slaves. You wouldn't want to give them their freedom. That's Aristotle, okay? So Saint, and that, that's Greco-Roman household codes, uh, the, the philosophy of the day. And St. Paul comes along and says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, we're all one in Christ. And the Holy Family emerges again. But it's not just for Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. Now this is you. You're brought into a Holy Family. Woo! Uh, yeah, we can leave the Greco-Roman ancient household code aside because St. Paul just said slave and free are the same. And that male and female are the same. And that... Uh, Gentile and Jew are the same. And you're about to say, see, they're the same. Oh, hold on. They're the same in what sense? The New Testament code, if you remember what we, we walked through, and I walked through with these two, uh, premarital counseling, uh, when we looked at the book of Ephesians, we didn't just pluck out the one thing about wives submit to your husbands. We went back through the, all of the chapters of the book of Ephesians and found that through the whole thing, he's saying there is one Lord, one Christ, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. But there are many vocations. There are many callings. There's many things that you're, some are given as pastors, some are given as this, some do this, some do this, some do this, so that we'll all work together until we find union in the perfect man in Christ. Then he talks about marriage and says, husbands, you should do this, wives, you should do this, but when you come together, you're one. And you actually, uh, we like to point out, you know, he said, wives, submit to your husbands. Twice in the, in the book before that, he says, submitting one to another, everybody submitting to the other. What does life look like when uh, you don't have a bully in the room and everyone's uh, thinking of each other's needs? Uh, and there isn't one person who's just accepting all of that. Uh, each person's thinking of the other. We get to uh, sort of a giant holy family, the church. Now, that's too much. <laughs> now we're getting, uh, we're getting down to it. We, we've really got to do some application. And so we're talking about questions for our day. And these are hard, okay? This, this is the hard part. Um, and the question for our day is, where is the harm? And by that question, I don't mean the way that, that we usually use that phrase. You know, where's the harm in a donut? You know, it's a, it's a rhetorical question. You're supposed to say, there is no harm, okay? I'm asking, and I'm saying that what the church needs to do is actually identify where is the harm, okay? Um, where is it? What in this circumstance is the harm? So, where is the harm in a mother who doesn't want her child? Where is the harm? You know, it's free country. I don't want my kid. Uh, I'll give him up. I, I used to work for Child Protective Services. Some mothers would gladly relinquish their, their parental rights to the state because they're sick of this kid. And so we had some kids in foster care whose parents were just sick of them. And they would say, I relinquish my parental rights. I'll do something that will make it impossible to receive them back. We're tired of them. Where is the harm in that? Well, the harm is that a mother is supposed to, right, care for her child. She's supposed to love that child. And she's supposed to wish that she, uh, she's supposed to be able to, be willing to do anything to protect that child, right? That's, that's the harm. The harm is that there's an ideal that's being broken, and it's sad to see, right? But you can still learn about an ideal mother by having a broken relationship with your mother. Don't get the message wrong. The hurt is hurting because there is a mother somewhere, okay? Where is the harm in a father who abandons his family? Free country? I'm sick of this family. Um, besides, I found this other lady, and, and uh, she's the younger model, and we'll go with her. Um, where is the harm? I'm not asking where is the harm, like, you know, free country. Where is the harm? The harm is that a father 
is meant to give himself as Christ for the church when he gives himself for his wife, which means to submit himself to her. He's meant to protect his family and to forget about his own stupid interests if they conflict with being the father of these kids. I'm looking at my little kids over there. I'm supposed to protect you, not abandon you. Where is the harm? The harm is in how ungodly and unchristlike an action that is because there is a father somewhere who's perfect and I'm meant to be in the image and likeness of him. That's where the harm is. Where is the harm in parents who abort a child to ease their own suffering? This is going to be very inconvenient for us to have this child. We're, uh, you know, when this Roe versus Wade thing came up uh, uh, just recently, I was listening to NPR and they had the most uh, demonic story about this family whose uh, their economic situation was bad and they were trying to get the listener to sympathize with the fact that they were poor and that's why they couldn't take this child into their home so she was going to have to go and have it surgically removed and, and killed. And we were supposed to say, isn't it terrible that in some states they won't do that? Think of the suffering she would have had by being poor. Ugh. Where's the harm? Well, there's an obvious one, which is that a life was taken. So where is the harm? Human beings are created in the image and likeness of God and are therefore sacred. If you don't believe it, well, that's where you're going to go. You're going to start to say things like, we got too many kids. The worst cell phone commercial I've ever seen in my life uh, came on the TV the other night, and it was this couple, you'll see it, this couple who... Uh, got married for the family plan, you know, on the cell phone. And then they found out that they would have a cheaper rate if they got kids, so they had kids. And then they found out that they have even, the price keeps going down the more kids they have, so the house is full of kids, right? Okay, and then she says, then I talked to my sister, who said you can get cheap rates even without kids. And they cut to her, and she says, yeah, you, don't, you know, I got the rate my, on my own. And they cut back to the family. And the kid's throwing a beach ball at her head. And, it, and it's supposed to be misery that you have a house full of children. Don't you wish you were alone with your cheap phone right? <laughs> That's the message. Verizon. You know, come with Verizon because with us, uh, you don't need kids. Oh, as a clergyman, if I, could climb, <laughs> if I could climb through the TV. Anyway, that's the mentality. They're saying, uh, you know... Uh, well, where's the harm in thinking that way? Well, as I always like to say, if young people don't like old people, that's stupid. You will be an old person one day. <laughs> if old people don't like young people, that's stupid. You were a young person, okay? We're actually all in the same ship of salvation. That's why they call it the nave. We're all in the navy together, okay? This is all one thing. Uh, where is the harm? Oh, goodness, okay? Where is the harm in parents who abuse each other or their children? Why is that considered bad? In some cultures, it's perfectly fine. But why is it bad? It's essentially bad and wrong because there is a holy family. And in that holy family, there is submission one to another. Uh, the Trinity is ultimately the family that the holy family is imaging. But nevertheless, when there is abuse, there's self-interest put over the other and such a self-interest that you'd be willing to hurt that person, to, to be rid of them, to silence them. Where is the harm? Um, the harm is that it is an ungodly, unchrist-like thing to do. Um, it does not image God, okay? If, if the, the only thing we value is rugged individualism, then get your boxing gloves on because someone's going to also be ruggedly individual and it may be your wife. Okay? <laughs> anyway, if your wife is ruggedly individual and you're ruggedly individual, well, rock em, sock em, you know, <laughs> because it's whoever wins. That's, that's the problem here. Um, what's the problem? Uh, well, it's bad for society. It fills up our prisons. Uh, you know, bruises, hurt. No, those are all secondary, secondary, secondary. The main thing, the main problem is that this is ungodly. 
it's not like God. Um, and that it's unholy in that sense. Okay, we're getting even more juicy now. You ready? Where is the harm? Okay, this is an award-winning children's book, and Tango makes three. So in Tango makes three, there are, there are two male penguins who adopt a, uh, a little penguin because they can't have children together because it's a homosexual relationship between the two penguins. It's a children's book, so we're teaching uh, that there's a diversity in families. Where is the harm? Great question. Where's the harm? Um, and I'm not saying, where's the harm in that? You hear me? I'm saying, where is the harm? Why is that a harmful thing? Why would Christians take a stand? Uh, where is the harm in family becoming whatever we want it to be? Where's the harm? The, as a Christian, you have to say the harm is that the family is given to us as a message from God about the nature of his love for us. The harm is in taking that love letter and cutting parts of it out or crossing parts of it out. Okay? How can you take the love letter that God has given us and read it upside down? Where's the harm? Because you don't get the message. You don't get the message. Um, where is the harm in replacing two parents with one on purpose? Well, because you'll have to learn via negativa then, the harm is in that a child uh, has a difficulty learning about the feminine and the masculine and how they interact and how fruit is born from that um, and how that relationship and that holy family is a message from God to us about the nature of who we are as people, the nature of our origin, and the nature of our destiny. Where's the harm in eliminating on purpose that message? Now something may happen where, you know, the, the two parents are replaced with one for something uh, that couldn't be helped. There is, of course, sorrow, but where is the sorrow? The sorrow is in that the holy family has been broken. But that doesn't mean the Holy Family doesn't exist or that that isn't an ideal. It means it's been broken in your experience. You still are learning the lesson. The message is still being proclaimed. Um, where is the harm in replacing opposite-sex parents with the same-sex parents? Well, the message is, is practically the same as replacing two parents with one. There's a message from God. You hear it's the same story over and over. <laughs> where is the harm? The harm is not automatic. The harm is not, oh gosh, you know, well, the, the, everyone goes to hell. That's the harm. The harm is that the family is God's message to us, woven into what we are as people, as human beings. And when we say, as nominalists, that we can make it whatever we want it to be and not harm anything, that's not, I, I, I say that's incorrect. You actually can harm the message of God, and you can actually jam that message so much that you don't hear anymore. That's a problem. What's the harm in dissolving marriage in favor of ease? Uh, we're older now. Um, our, our spouses are, are deceased. And so we're going to uh, live together because marriage is too complicated. Uh, isn't that okay? What's the, what's the difficulty in dissolving marriage and just living together? You know, you've got you to gotta try this out before you, uh, before you get married. You know, how are you going to know if you'll live well together if you don't uh, uh, live together before you're married? Um, how's that going to work? Well, how has it worked for thousands of years? Uh, dissolving marriage in favor of ease is a problem, and the harm is in jamming the message of the Holy Family. Christ who gives himself for the church, the, the woman uh, as the church gives herself for Christ or respects Christ at least. They respect the sanctity of that relationship and want to preserve it as much as possible so that the message is walked out in their own household. What's the harm? The harm is is in taking the love letter of God and cutting portions of it out and crossing things out and throwing things away and saying, I'll make the love letter whatever I want. You're going to miss the message. 
Where is the harm in the philosophies of follow your heart as long as you're happy and live your truth? Okay? Where is the harm in those ideas? Follow your heart sounds so good because surely it's just your mind that is confused. Your heart knows the truth. Follow your heart. Okay. Um, have you ever wanted something not realizing that it was harmful for you until you partook of it, received the harm, and realized your heart was wrong? <laughs> okay? You were sincerely wrong about the direction you were headed. The wise uh, wisdom of the ages was calling to you, stop, stop, don't do it. You're going to hurt yourself. There will be harm on this path. And you say, doesn't matter. My heart is leading me this way. And you walk right as a lamb led to the slaughter. But you wanted it, and it was your heart's desire. So people say, well, as long as he's happy. As long as he's happy, it's okay. You know, I've received a lot of uh, wounds in my life, and so I ought to have uh, whatever I want now because I've suffered so much. And people say, well, that's true, you did suffer a lot, as long as you're happy. Uh, where is the harm in as long as you're happy? I'm happiest driving down the left side of the road because I love England. England is my favorite country. And I'm happiest there, and since I don't have the money for a plane ticket, I'm going to drive down the left side of the road and drink uh, Earl Grey tea on the way. You get in a head-on collision, you hurt a bunch of people and yourself. And then it occurs to you, you're not in England, this isn't England, okay? Where is the harm in living your truth? If your truth is false, you will get into a head-on collision, you will hurt yourself and others. That's what's wrong with it. That's where the harm is. But what if, uh, well, I could go on and on. I think you understand what I'm saying. The better... Uh, question to be asking, I think, is where is the harm? Where is the harm? Okay, now if you're, yeah, anyhow. And this is the real question. Is the real, is the family holy or is it a construct? Okay? If the family is holy, then the individual has to conform to the holy ideal. Otherwise, they're either lost or on the broad path that leads to destruction. <clears throat> and if you're okay with le being led uh, to destruction, well then, hey, do whatever you want to do. Um, if, the, if the family is holy, it suggests there is actually a narrow gate and a straight path. But uh, people hate to conform to an ideal, especially an ideal that they didn't construct themselves. Okay, I didn't think of this one. Somebody told me to. I hate conforming. Uh, and so we will say there are no forms I will do whatever I want. Uh, and that is an answer to a different question. So if, if family is a construct, and it simply is a social contract that we've invented for ourselves to make things as peaceful as possible, to eliminate suffering as much as possible, but the circumstances are changing, if it's a construct, well then, the laws, the church, norms, and everything must conform with the times and with the majority. Okay? Um, and so, we even find churches today that are quite confused about this. As the culture changes, we must change with the culture because uh, this is really just sort of a construct anyway. That's a big question. Is it holy? In other words, sacred and set apart, or is it constructed by us, something we use to get us through the day, like a car? Before there was a car, there was a horse, right? And you can say, I swear by horses, horses are the way, um, and I'll never drive one of those iron horses, you know? Yes, you will be tossed in the dustbin of history. <laughs> that, I guess you could say, riding a horse is a construct. And the construct changed. We got these cars now, okay? Is the family like that, where it used to be horses, but now it's cars? Get with it, dummy. It used to be uh, MS-DOS, but now it's iPhone. Are you telling me you're, you're going to walk around with your Tandy computer and, you know, and try to type in the codes and get your 
floppy, five inch floppy disk. That's how you live life. Get with it. That's, that's old. Get with what's going on now. Is the family like that? Of course, you're going to get, I'm going to say, no, <laughs> it's not like that. The family is not like your iPhone that you just update every time an update gets sent down. Um, I like iPhones, but family is not the same. People love to construct and conform to their own ideal. Okay, we're at the very end. You go all the way back to the beginning, Eden. What was the problem in Eden? Disobedience, faithlessness. People want to do their own thing, dang it. Don't tell me what I can and cannot do. It's the same story. It goes through the whole of human history. It's all the same thing. Um, and the questions are the same, which is, is this real or is this made up? There's your question, okay? That's where faith comes in also. Uh, Satan, or the, the serpent, comes to Eve and says, it's made up. Do whatever you want to do. And she says, thank goodness, because I've, I've always wanted to do whatever I want to do. And the result, disaster. How do we get back to a new Eden? First of all, there's a cannonball splash of history the incarnation, Pfft, waves go in all directions, water splashed over the whole line of human history, and we look back and say something happened there that was perfect. It was perfect. And that Christ remains perfect. How do you speak to the world about that? And here's a, here's a great one. Quoting Bible verses to people who don't believe in the Bible? Okay. I was uh, raised in a church that said, you know, uh, when you evangelize, quote scriptures. What if people don't believe in the scriptures? <laughs> well, I didn't think of that. Huh, I thought everybody believed in the, in the scriptures. Uh, they don't believe in scriptures. Well, you're going to have to think of something else. You know, you're going to have to slam your pulpit harder or take your shoe off and hit the pulpit. Maybe that'll do it. And as the people are... Dis are fleeing from you and your message, you should think again. Okay, how about pointing to statistics and studies that prove the point? Okay, you have just conceded that you rely on statistics and studies for truth. And statistics and studies can say whatever you want statistics and studies to say. Well, families are, are better and, and kids do, do very well when they're in a two-family, uh, uh, two-family, when they're in a two-parent home, they do better in school, and that's why I believe in the family. Bad answer. <laughs> You've just conceded that the, the, the authority is science, and let's say it's determined that it's much less of a burden on society for families to be uh, one parent or, or something like that. Uh, there's less, you know, less trouble, and kids do better in school that way. Now where are you at? Well, uh, uh, you know, uh, Epistle to the Ephesians? And people say, no, no, we don't believe in the Bible. We don't believe in either of these. Okay. Perhaps the true answer is conform yourself and your family that you have some control over to Christ and the Holy Family. Your family, okay? The best you can conform yourself to Christ and your family to the Holy Family. And... Uh, I bet you'll have a better effect. And you can also point people to Christ and his holy family. Because, as we've been saying, via negativa, via positiva, through the whole of human history, broken families, whole families, good kings, evil kings, the same message is woven into us. Can people agree or not agree? In, in a sense, you don't even have to argue. Would it be better if my mother hadn't left me? Yes. Would it be better if my parents hadn't had an abusive relationship? Yes. Would it have been better if I had had a stable home? Yes. Would it have been better? All of these things are yes because we're silhouetting a holy family. And you can hate it. You can say, that's a construct. I hate it. Uh, the, there's buzzers and flies gathering already. You just said hate. 
I'm filled with hatred for the way that I've been made and for the reality I live in. I hate it. Okay, well, um, I, if that's the way you want to go, um, I think it's better, better than quoting Bible verses, better than even being elected to office, better than voting on a, on, on a whatchamacallit, you should do all those things, etc. You should actually point to Christ with your own life and your own family in so much as you can. Um, and when people say, yeah, but your family's broken, you can say, yes, I know that. But I am doing my darndest to make sure that from now on I, I am as Christ-like as I, I can be and our family image is a holy family. And that's the end. And we're way, out, way past time because I had a lot to say today. Any questions or comments, though, in the... Yes, uh, Mr. Ethan. Right, um, and that, that was, uh, we, we had a, yeah, it was last week we talked about love, and it's, a, it's absolutely right, um, and when someone is curious about your family that irritates me so much because you seem to be so healthy, one day they'll say, how are you doing that? <laughs> and there's your answer. Then you can turn to the Bible verse, Ephesians chapter whatever, uh, chapter 5, you can, you can point to uh, statistics and all that if you want, but the real core of it is not statistics, or even uh, Bible says it, that does it, or however that saying goes. <laughs> it's the fact that Christ is real, the incarnation is real, the Holy Family is real, and you are created for that family. You can't get away from it. The end. <laughs> all right.